Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Diana Bittner. I am with True Women Health, and welcome to this episode of Let's Chat. We have had a whole Let's Chat series. There's already several that are archived on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about belly fat and chin hair. So this is a topic that a lot of people deal with. A lot of people have said that they were going to tune in um, because it's affecting them, and it's, it's all too common. So a little housekeeping, next week we're going to Let's Chat with Dr. Becky Lynn of St. Louis about bringing happiness back into the bedroom. And we're going to talk about all what that entails. So please uh, look at our, um, our conversations leading up to that. Please leave questions in advance if you have any questions about bringing happiness back into the bedroom, talking about sexual health. So, so look forward to that. But let's really get into the meat of the issue. Um, Belly fat is not always thought of connected with chin hair, and I'll bring that together. But what we're going to talk about today is why is belly fat different than other kinds of fat? Why do women in midlife and menopause have to deal more with belly fat? And what does it do to our health? I'm also going to talk about five tips to not gain belly fat, and also five things that I want you to ask your healthcare provider your doctor, your nurse, or your physician assistant, or your certified nurse midwife. Whoever you see for your health care, there are five things that you need to know, especially when it comes to weight gain in midlife and menopause. So again, let's get started. Uh, this is something that I never really thought about in the early days of being an OBGYN. So I've been an OBGYN for over 26 years, and for about the first 10 years, I was just really busy doing general OBGYN work, never felt like work, but delivering babies, doing surgery, seeing lots of women every day for, let's say, their annual exams or issues with bleeding. And women would say to me on the off, like, oh, I just, I don't get why I just gained 30 pounds. And I would internally think, of course, quietly, like, what do you mean you don't know how you gain 30 pounds? How can you not know how you gain 30 pounds? I mean, it's just eating more and working out less, right? And, and so I would say something very politely to that extent and move on to whatever she was there for. But I started to see a pattern. The longer that I started, that I worked as an OBGYN, I saw women for their annual exams, I would always ask women, what's hard for you? And when women would say, oh, this belly fat, this back fat, this bra fat, like what, what is happening to me? And Again, why am I gaining all this weight? It doesn't make sense. So I started to see patterns. Certain women were more likely to gain belly fat. Women who had a family history of diabetes. Women who were of Hispanic descent, Asian descent, of Indian descent, you know, from India. So women who have certain genetic traits um, and especially women with a family history of diabetes or let's say they had diabetes in pregnancy, then they're much more likely to gain that belly fat. And I really, again, started to see a pattern with women who would say, I don't know how I gained 30 pounds. And I started asking more questions rather than just blowing it off. I said, well, tell me what happened. And it was really interesting, again, to see the pattern. What happened, for example, with one, one woman is she, she fell um, shoveling snow, broke her shoulder, and she was out of commission for really any activity for about three to four months. And so in that time, of course, she was on the couch. She had a big surgery. Um, and what do people do, which is lovely? They bring you casseroles. They bring you all this comfort food. You can't really, beggars can't be choosers, right? So she wasn't likely to say, hey, could you make me a salad with chicken? If somebody brought tuna noodle, then she would eat it. Also, she wasn't exercising. She wasn't working out. She was sitting and resting. She just really couldn't do much with her um, recovery time. So that first 10 pounds makes total sense. Um, for some women, once they get up and get moving again, after that injury, after that long bronchitis, after a bout of taking care of their mom who's in the hospital, a lot of women as they get back into normal activity and eating their normal diet, the weight just comes off. But for women who are insulin resistant, we're gonna talk about that. Women who are insulin resistant, once they gain that 10 pounds of fat, it just comes on quickly after that that belly fat drives insulin resistance. And it makes a woman who's already at risk for insulin resistance or she's already insulin resistant, 
it makes her even more insulin resistant. And once you get into that vicious cycle, it is so hard to break. And the thing that made me most sad is when women get stuck in that cycle, a lot of times they give up because nothing's working. A little bit more exercise, a little less food, then they get starving and they gain even quicker. So again, it just becomes that vicious cycle. So when I started to see that pattern, I really wanted to understand what was going on. And I happened to find this book called Sugar Busters. And we'll, we'll post about that book. The book is called Sugar Busters. And what it does is it teaches the glycemic index. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, but, but again, it's about who's insulin resistance and what is that. So let's, let's go back. What is insulin resistance? So uh, what I want you to think about is insulin is the key that opens the door to the cells to let the sugar go in. So on all of our cells, our brain cells, our muscle cells, our belly fat cells, we need sugar in those cells to function, right? So we need sugar in our brain to think. We need sugar in our um, muscles to move. Um, we don't really want sugar to go into our fat cells where it gets converted to fat. But, but the insulin is what drives the sugar into the cell. And so our cells, especially brain cells and muscle cells, will get insulin resistant, meaning it takes more insulin per unit of sugar to get that sugar into the cell. And so when we eat something, our insulin is what let it, lets it go into the muscle or the, or the brain to work. And when someone is insulin resistant, it means, it, again, it takes more insulin per sugar. So when someone is consistently insulin resistant, they get more and more insulin in order to get sugar into the cells. And so when they eat something, they have a bigger insulin response. And that insulin response pushes that sugar right into the fat. And so it promotes fat storage. When women are insulin resistant and they have higher insulin levels over time, what happens is that they crave sugar. So women will come in to me and say, eh, there's, I don't think there's much we can do. I'm, I'm addicted to carbs. I'm a carbaholic. And I'll say, it's not that you're addicted to carbs. Your fat is addicted to carbs. And insulin is that voice that makes you crave. And when you eat a little bit of simple carb, then what happens is then your insulin goes up and it makes you crave more. So you know how, for example, you might treat yourself to, let's say, a donut or pancakes with Aunt Jemima maple syrup in the morning. So you have a really high sugar breakfast. What are you going to do the rest of the day? You're going to crave sugar. So that's what happens is that when you eat a high sugar meal or a treat, your insulin goes up and it makes you crave even more. So again, more, some women are just much more insulin resistant. And it can be that, you know, some women are insulin resistant at a lower body fat. They can be maybe just even five pounds overweight or they get to, they're not insulin resistant until they gain 50, 60, 75 pounds. So insulin resistance can be, can be brought on by weight. So women who have a condition such as polycystic ovarian disease, PCOD, we think that the, the source of that is likely insulin resistance. And what happens is when people have, let's say initially during when they start puberty, they gain a lot of weight, that can trigger a whole cycle of irregular periods, maybe extra ovarian cysts, higher blood sugar, higher insulin levels. And what does that do? It promotes belly fat. And if women get more belly fat, they become more insulin resistant. And it's that whole cycle of events. And so, you know, what happens too is then it, it can be really frustrating when women aren't seeing again that they're making any headway in their progress. And so, you know, what does belly fat do? So I want to talk about like how is belly fat different than let's say fat that you might gain in your thigh or, or your arms. Belly fat is different metabolically. When we gain that fat in our belly, it's almost like it's going to Siberia. It's stuck there. It's so hard to get it back out. And belly fat that we store in our or fat that we store in our belly is also puts us at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, for heart attack, for stroke, for dementia, because the belly fat um, then can store extra hormones. We're going to talk about chin hairs, but also can increase to increase our risk because of inflammatory factors. So those fat cells can then make more inflammatory factors that increase our risk of heart disease. So when people have belly fat, again, it's different 
and significantly alters our risk of those issues. The other deal about belly fat and insulin resistance is that low estrogen can make us at higher risk for insulin resistance. So for example, think of those couple days before a period where you're craving more simple carbs, more simple sugar. What happens is that as estrogen drops, we become more insulin resistant. And let's say that you have a couple hot flashes, night sweats during that time. What happens is sleep deprivation can increase insulin resistance. So there's other factors that relate to that premenstrual time or especially in perimenopause when of course, with lower estrogen levels for a period of time, maybe a couple weeks, then what happens is that with sleep deprivation, that can cause insulin to go up. If we're already insulin resistant because of low estrogen, and now I'm stressed out and I'm sleep deprived, then that is going to increase my insulin and it just keeps the whole vicious cycle going. So what I want you to think about is that when you have insulin resistance, your insulin goes up, which makes you crave sugar. And when you eat sugar, when you're insulin resistant, that extra insulin pushes it straight to the belly fat. So back to the book, Sugar Busters. Sugar Busters teaches us the glycemic index. And this is so important for you to know, but to basically summarize it up, if you don't want to read the book, um, is, is the glycemic index is a scale given to food that goes from 100 down to zero. And when something is a glycemic index of 100, it means that it can raise your blood sugar really quickly and then when it raises quickly, it can drop quickly because the insulin pushes it straight into fat. When something has a low glycemic index, your blood sugar raises slowly, it stays that way for three to four hours, and then drops off slowly. So it helps not be hungry, and it helps you be able to use that sugar, that, that carbohydrate for energy, and have it not get stuck straight in fat. So when we talk a high glycemic index food, that would be table sugar. That would be white rice. That would be white potatoes. Eating mashed potatoes is like eating something with sugar. I mean, there are good things about mashed potatoes. There are, there's a good vitamin C, but it really is a high glycemic index food. And so when you eat white potatoes, your blood sugar goes up, and then with a half an hour, it's dropped off pretty quick. And likely those extra calories, those carbs have gone into belly fat. Whereas if someone eats a sweet potato with a glycemic index of around 60, 65, then what happens again is your blood sugar goes up slowly, it stays there for a bit, and then it drops off slowly. And so that is really important in terms of how do you deal with, with belly fat. And we'll talk about those five tips. So it's really important to know glycemic index and so important then in terms of how to structure your day. So this can, I think it's again, so important that you understand the basics, but sometimes it can be a little confusing and I'll never forget. I had a patient who sat um, in my office. She was around 63 years old. She had prediabetes already and she was very frustrated. We had dealt with an issue of postmenopausal bleeding and she was all good. And I said, now that we've got that figured out, talk to me, what's hard for you? And she said, what's so hard for me is I want to go on vacation with my sister, and I can't. And I said, well, what do you mean you can't go on vacation with your sister? And she said, I'm too tired. I'm too heavy. I, I don't feel like I can get up in the bus. They wanted to go to Branson and go to concerts and take the bus. And she said, I, I don't feel like I can go. I don't feel like I'll sit comfortably. I'll fit comfortably in the bus seat. I won't have energy to walk around. Um, I might as well just kind of give up on ever going on vacation again. I said, you're only 63. What do you mean you're going to give up? And she said, I've tried to lose weight my whole life and it just nothing's ever worked. And she said, I know what you're saying about insulin resistance, but I really, I really don't get it. And I'm not going to read the book and I'm not going to read your book. I just, I don't tend to read books. So I don't know what to do. And I said, okay, let's try a different approach. And I said, give me the name of a woman you don't like. And she smiled and she said, Gladys. She was really mean to me in high school. I said, okay, Gladys, let's name your belly fat Gladys. Gladys doesn't like you. Your belly fat doesn't like you. Your belly fat wants you tired and lazy and sitting on the couch because the less you do, then she'll get bigger. And her voice is insulin. So Gladys is talking to you and saying, eat that chocolate, eat that bread. And when you eat that chocolate, does it go to you and your brain or your muscles? No. 
it goes straight to Gladys. So it, you can't use it for energy. You can't use it for thinking. It makes you tired because what happens again, you eat that chocolate, that bread, your blood sugar goes up and it crashes because Gladys sucks it right out of your blood. And so it gets stuck in Gladys. So Gladys gets bigger and you essentially get smaller. Your thinking gets smaller, your energy gets smaller, your muscle gets smaller. So I, I asked this patient, I said, so who's going to win this one, you or Gladys? <laughs> and she, she reacted. She said, oh, Gladys isn't going to win this one. So she, she went off and she seemed like she had a plan or she at least was thinking about it. So about eight weeks later, my nurse came to me and said, there's someone out in the waiting room who will not leave until you go out to see her. So I went out there and it was her. And she said, I just wanted to show you that I am winning this one. Gladys is not. And she had told Gladys to shut up. She wasn't listening to her anymore. And she said, I decided not to feed Gladys. I decided to feed me. So she had started eating more brown rice. She had started eating more whole wheat bread. She started walking a little bit more and she fought back and she lost eight pounds. She hadn't lost weight in years. And she said, I am going on vacation. So that just, of course, made my day, but it really helped her make sense of why she could never lose weight and why she gained. And she probably likely would drop her blood sugar over time and add years to her life. So then the other part of our let's chat tonight is about that chin hair. So how does belly fat and chin hair um, go together? I'll never forget, I gave a talk with 500 people. It was at Meyer Gardens and I was talking about belly fat and because I know that connection exists to chin hair. And I said, you know, and chin hair. And the whole crowd was like, what? And then later on, I'm talking and I said, belly fat. And I kind of moved my hands and the whole crowd went chin hair. And I thought, wow, this really resonates with people. And I think it's a big deal that we don't always talk about. If any of us have a little bit of chin hair, of course, we don't want anyone else to see it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't admit to it. But a lot of people deal with chin hair as they get older. So, so. So the, the medical term for that is hirsutism or male pattern hair growth. And what happens is that when we start to get belly fat cells, it stores extra pro-hormones that can be converted into hormones that look like testosterone. So we make, as women, we make testosterone from our adrenal glands, from our ovary, and those pro-hormones, they can all get stored up. And if we have extra fat cells, then we're going to store up and have extra of those pre-hormones. Those pre-hormones then get converted by the enzyme into androstenedione, um, DHEAS, and testosterone, and estrone. You don't have to remember all that, but basically those hormones then stimulate the hair cells that make dark hairs in male pattern areas. So that would be chin, mustache, it would be maybe on the chest, on the belly, above the pubic area, and maybe even around your backside. Um, so some people if it gets really bad, we'll get male pattern baldness. And so, you know, that can bother women more than anything. Of course, that extra hair growth, but then, of course, hair loss. And so all of that can relate to that hair circular levels of those hormones that I mentioned. So the number one treatment is to get rid of some of that belly fat, which can, can be difficult, and we'll talk about options for, for treating that. But the issue, too, is that once those hair cells get growing and they get stimulated and turned on, they, they don't turn off. And so it's to make sure no new ones are starting. And once we've got the problem under control, then maybe it's worth your money to get those, those cells destroyed with laser, with electrolysis. But in the meantime, it's to treat the original problem. And so it's, it's looking for those issues. There also is a medication that sometimes we'll use excuse me, called spironolactone. It's a mild diuretic that can also block the testosterone receptors on those hair cells, and it can slow down the development of new chin hair cells starting to grow. So again, so that little bit of, bit of belly fat, maybe it doesn't bother you so much. You can just get a bigger pair of jeans and you know, nothing's working, so I'm not going to worry about that. But when the chin hair starts and that, that can be an issue sometimes that can get people really motivated to understand what's going on. So it is possible to not have to deal with these things. And so I want to talk about some tips and tricks. And again, it's like, who does this affect? So number one, 
insulin resistance and belly fat inch in here, it can affect a lot of different people. So number one, it's patients who come in who are in midlife and menopause. They say, I'm gaining weight and I don't know why. I'm not doing anything different. Why am I gaining weight? And so as people get into this insulin resistance, when their estrogen drops, that can be a trigger. Again, women who have had diabetes in pregnancy, they're at very high risk for insulin resistance and prediabetes and diabetes. Again, there are cultural groups. For example, women of Hispanic descent, it's in the genes. It's such a higher risk if you're of Hispanic descent to develop that insulin resistance and belly fat. In India, we know that it's very uh, a high risk in the genes in terms of being insulin resistant. We know that almost one third of women in India at midlife and beyond have prediabetes or diabetes. So in some cultures, it's much more of an issue. And of course, unfortunately, the diabetes has put certain groups of our population at higher risk for, for being affected by COVID. So it's one of those things that it's really important to address if, if that's in your genetic history. And so I wanna talk about several tips of what we can do to avoid this belly fat. And number one is to again know what is glycemic index. Glycemic index, again, is that score of food that, it, you know, whether or not it's going to raise your blood sugar quickly or lower. So, again, if you have a carb that's a lower glycemic index, it's not as likely to go to belly fat. So tip number one, no glycemic index. Number two, it's really important to take in small servings of complex carbs all day long. So, again, what is a complex carbs? or a low glycemic, it's a carbohydrate that has color. Now we need energy, we need carbohydrate to think, to act. If I'm not eating much much um, carbs in a day, I'm not gonna be able to think as, think as well. And so it's so important to have those little bits of carbs all day long. So I might start my morning with Ezekiel bread and peanut butter, or I might have my protein shake with some yellow banana in it. Yellow banana is low sugar, Brown banana is high sugar. So I might have mid-morning a Triscuit and a cheese stick. So again, I'm gonna have a complex carb or a whole wheat cracker and a little bit of protein like in a mozzarella cheese stick. At lunch, for example, my favorite lunch is to have a salad with some brown rice and olive oil and then some leftover protein from the night before. Snack in the afternoon, I'm gonna pick a low glycemic fruit like an apple um, and have some nuts or have some peanut butter or you know some kind of protein with my complex carb. And if I'm in a place where maybe I wanna lose a little weight or I wanna make sure and keep my weight real stable, then I might not have any carbs at all after four. That's the trick, is to make sure we're having those complex carbs, but then at dinner, maybe just having a protein and a vegetable. So tip number three is that, limit simple carbs toward the end of the day. What tends to happen during the day, of course, at the end we get tired, Maybe dinner or dinner hour is stressful. And so it's the time where our adrenaline is a little higher. Maybe our cortisol is lower, so our insulin response is higher. So there's lots of reasons that it's probably best to avoid simple carbs at night. So again, if you're in a place where you want to lose a little bit of belly fat or you are loving where you are with your weight and you want to stay there, then I would definitely recommend no carbs after four. So dinner is a protein and a veg, maybe and a salad. That's it. You don't have to make a separate dinner for yourself and your family. Just for example, last night I grilled chicken, I made vegetables, and I made pasta. I had the chicken, I had the vegetable, I did not have the pasta. And so if too, then you're wanting a simple carb, let's say a glass of wine at dinner. Okay, you have your glass of wine, that's your treat. You get one treat a day. And if you have that wine at night, again, it's just a higher risk that it's gonna go to belly fat. And so if you maybe don't do that, every night, or if you really want some wine, maybe have two ounces and then add some club soda. Limit that sugar at night. Tip number four is learn recipes and menus that make it easy. So again, to have that complex carb all throughout the week, in the beginning of the week, I'll roast a bunch of sweet potatoes, I'll make a big pot of brown rice, if that's what I want to have during the week, I think ahead. But maybe I'll make a pot of wheat berries, or I'll make some bulgur, or I'll make some some other carb, even quinoa, just to have, because those carbs take longer to cook. And so if I'm gonna have those complex carbs around, then I can do lots of different things with them. 
I can have rice and chicken. I can do rice with a paella. I can do rice with, um, in, you know, Asian, my kids love Asian noodles. So I'll do udon noodles or brown rice with vegetables and tofu or protein. So there's lots of options to learn these recipes and there's lots of books, there's lots of resources. If you choose to be a patient at True, then you would get to have a consult with Anna, our nutritionist, and go through your diet and figure out how you could trade off little things. So for example, to learn new recipes, let's say that your diet tends to be white flour tortillas and white rice. Those are high glycemic index foods. And if also you happen to be Hispanic and that's just what you've grown up eating, then it's just one feeds the other and you're at very high risk for belly fat and diabetes. And so it's to just even make little changes and replace the white flour tortilla with a whole wheat tortilla, your white rice with brown rice. And even just so those simple changes can make a big difference. Number five is to maintain muscle mass. We know from large studies like the Nurses Health Study and the Women's Health Initiative, we know that women who maintain their muscle mass, they're the women who are able to keep their weight off long term. So, for example, if you grew up playing a sport like, like, you know, like soccer, or if you were really active and you gained really good muscle mass, you're going to be, it's going to be easier for you to maintain your weight, maybe even lose weight as you get older versus someone who didn't ever have that muscle mass, it might be harder the rest of their life. So if you don't have a lot of lean muscle mass or body mass, then find, gain, gain it, figure out how to add some strength training to your exercise, but to maintain or to gain some muscle mass to be able to keep a healthy weight. If you choose to come to true, we have a body fat percentage scale. So for example, if you gain a little bit of weight because you're working out more, Sometimes we'll say, oh, it's fine that I gained a little weight because it's just muscle, right? Well, let's prove it. Let's look at that body fat percentage scale and see if in fact that you have gained lean mass or if you've gained body fat. And so it's really important to maintain the muscle mass in order for you to keep off your weight. The other, so those are the five tips. So again, number one, no glycemic index. Number two, take in small servings of complex carbs all day long. Number three, limit those simple carbs at night. Number four, learn recipes, be creative, figure out how to add those complex carbs to your diet. And number five, maintain your muscle mass. So the next thing I want to talk about are those five questions that, that I want you to ask your healthcare provider. So it's so important to know things about our health. Um, it can be easy to kind of just go through life saying, oh, I'll figure it out later. I've seen way too many women suffer unnecessarily from heart attacks or diabetes or stroke or dementia because they never took the time or it just never was a priority or they asked a question and maybe it wasn't addressed correctly. You deserve to know things about your health that will make a difference for life. So let's go through them. So number one, I want you to ask your healthcare provider, figure out what is your phase of ovarian function. I think it's so important for women to know what phase of ovarian function is. So as our ovary, which makes our hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, as our ovary goes through phases, reproductive phase, when we have regular periods, perimenopause, when our periods start to change, menopause, no periods, our estrogen levels change, and that can impact our risk for insulin resistance. So if you're in late perimenopause, you went 60 days without a period, you didn't sleep, hot flashes, night sweats, you're starting to gain belly fat, well, why do you think that is? It's because you're not sleeping, it's because you're craving sugar, and it's because you're insulin resistant. So all of those things together, many women will gain 10 to 15 pounds in the first year after that last menstrual period. It doesn't have to happen. So if you know what your phase is, then you can know what to expect, right? And then it's easier to deal with and we can help you with that. Question number two, I want you to ask, do I have prediabetes? So many women walk around with prediabetes and don't even know it. What are the symptoms? Number one, weight gain that you just cannot get off, especially if it's in your belly fat area. Number two is craving. If you're craving sugar all the time, and again, you would say, I'm addicted to carbs, you could have prediabetes. 
If you had diabetes in pregnancy, you're at high risk. If, if everyone in your family has had diabetes, you could be at risk. If you have pre-diabetes, we have an opportunity to help you before you turn in, before it turns into diabetes. Once you have diabetes, once that A1C, we'll talk about that, once that blood sugar level goes over 6.3, then you have a very high risk for heart disease that we never drop, even if you can drop your blood sugars. So you have the opportunity when you're in pre-diabetes to turn it around. And I tell you what, nothing brings me more pleasure to see that A1C come down. I've had so many patients that have come in to me and say they have those symptoms. They can't lose weight. They're craving sugar. We check a blood sugar. We check a waist circumference. And what do you know? They have prediabetes. If that hadn't been diagnosed, perhaps within six months, they would have diabetes. But guess what? With knowledge, seeing a dietitian, reading sugar busters, really understanding what their options are, they can turn that number around. And sure enough, when those women come in, we diagnose, and then three months later, we check it, and that number has come down, and they just added years to their life. So again, I want everyone to know whether or not they have prediabetes. And us healthcare providers, we know how to figure it out. So ask us. Number three, what are your numbers? I want you to be brave. And number one, ask, what is your waist circumference? So having someone measure a tape measure around your belly when you're not pregnant can feel very private. It can feel very intimate to have someone measure your belly fat. Just get over it. You've got to know your number. We know that women who have a waist circumference greater than 35 inches have a much higher risk of heart attack, of diabetes, of dementia, of stroke. I mean, really, who wants any of that? So know what your number is. Um, for some people, maybe they are comfortable with a waist circumference over 35. That's okay. We don't have to be all skinny to be happy and healthy. But my point is then if, you're, if your waist circumference is greater than 35, then you really have to know your numbers and make sure that everything else is as healthy as can be so you don't have that unnecessary heart attack. I want you to know what your blood sugar is. So there's two different ways to look at blood sugar. One is a fasting blood sugar. So fasting blood sugar in the 70s and 80s, normal, right? Low 90s, normal. But if it starts to creep up to the high 90s, if it certainly goes over 100, it is not normal. So I want you to, like if you've ever seen a doc who's got Epic and you can go into your record at My Health, I want you to go in and look at your fasting blood sugars. And if they've been creeping up, you know, if you get your blood levels checked once a year, I want you to look at that level. If it's getting to be 97, 98, 99, you need to know that. And then the next step would be to consider having what's called an A1C. So an A1C is a percentage of your blood uh, of your red blood cells that have sugar stuck to them. So it's a way to look at an average of blood sugar over three months because blood those cells stay there for about three months. And so we can get an average of your blood sugar over the last three months. And that number will come back as a percentage. So we know that less than 5.6 is normal. 5.6 to 6.3 is in the prediabetes range and over 6.3 is likely diabetes. We can test further with a fasting test, like if you've been pregnant, you know you drink that sweet stuff and you get a fasting and then you get your blood sugar after you drink the sweet stuff. That could be a test we might need to do. But we can tell most things with a fasting blood sugar and an A1C. So if you have any risk for diabetes, get an A1C checked. It's so important. And again, we, can, we don't wanna miss that window of opportunity. The other number I want you to know is your triglycerides. Triglycerides is a measure of a type of fat in your blood that we do when we do a fasting lipid profile. So my son recently made me watch a movie called Game Changers on Netflix, and it talks about athletes who, are, who eat plant-based diet or are vegetarian and how it really can help performance to have that plant-based diet. And it showed an example that was very startling to me. These were NBA basketball players or football, I can't remember, but they were elite athletes and they were eating, for example, a plant-based diet versus one player loved to have like three chicken sandwiches, like a Popeye's or a Chick-fil-A, you know, like a fried chicken sandwich before his game. It was his treat to himself. And so they measured his blood several hours after he ate that fried chicken sandwich and they spun it down and his blood was white. Triglycerides are white and it comes from that simple carb, that white bun, and the fat that's used to fry the chicken. So it's so important to think about what are we eating and how is it affecting my triglycerides? 
when we have fat in the blood, like triglycerides, I want you to think about it like cheese on a pizza. So if you have it flowing through your blood vessels, it's going to clog the plumbing over time. And it can increase the risk again of heart disease and stroke. So it goes along with that blood sugar. So again, tip number three, know your numbers. The other number that I want to mention is called a high sensitivity CRP. So the CRP is a measure in your blood of your inflammatory factor. And we'll go into the Reynolds score with that, but the CRP is really necessary to figure out a Reynolds score. A CRP, again, measures inflammation. Now, CRP can be high because you had a bad cold. It can be high because of arthritis, or you sprained your ankle, or you had a bad fall with a bruise. But if it's persistently high, it can tell us that you have high risk for heart attack or stroke. So tip number four is what is my Reynolds score? So Reynolds score is a gender specific score to look at your risk for heart disease, um, for heart disease, for risk of a heart attack. And when I say gender specific, us women are different than men. We're not little men. We develop heart disease differently. And so the Reynolds score looks at our family history. It looks at our cholesterol. It looks at our blood pressure. And it looks at our A1C. So it's really important to know that numbers. You can even go online by yourself and look Google Reynolds score, put in the numbers, and you can definitely see whether or not you have a higher risk of having a heart attack in the next five years or over your lifetime. So it's something that we also use when women come to us um, in consultation to see if they want to take hormone replacement therapy to treat their symptoms of menopause. And let's say a woman has a, some more risk factors for heart disease, I will definitely calculate a Reynolds score to look and see if she has a higher risk of heart disease. And it would make me ask her to do extra testing before we would start that hormone replacement therapy to really understand her risk of heart attack. So again, I want every woman to know her Reynolds score. You deserve to know so you don't have to have that unnecessary heart attack. Tip number five is what are my options for treatment? If you're like everybody else, it's really hard to keep doing something like have some hunger, have extra hunger, to calorie restrict, to exercise more if we're not making headway. So if you are struggling with insulin resistance, you're struggling with belly fat, and it's really hard to get on a plan that's making a difference, then sometimes an option for treatment would be, for example, a medicine called metformin. So this isn't a crutch. It's not going to do the work for you. But what it does is it treats insulin resistance. So it helps our cells not be as insulin resistant. So it gives us a chance that our efforts will work. And so it's a treatment for prediabetes. And if we look at large groups of women that are on a placebo, nothing, versus metformin, versus a plant-based healthy diet, metformin isn't really that much better than that healthy plant-based diet and exercise. But if you've done that and you're not making headway, then adding metformin, which is a very safe medication, it can really make a difference and give someone a chance to get ahead. So, for example, I've had patients who have chosen to go on metformin for three or six or even nine months. They're really making headway. They're feeling better. They're losing weight. Again, metformin is not a weight loss drug, but it allows them to make headway. Their blood sugar drops. They're feeling better. And now they're addicted to this healthy lifestyle. They're active. They're eating well. And now we have added years on their life because of metformin. A lot of times these women can then go off the metformin because they've already figured it out and they're back in a much healthier place. They essentially have really told Gladys to shut up and they are not anymore having to deal with that level of insulin resistance. Also in terms of treatment for chin hair, again, we talked about weight loss, plant-based diet, healthy eating, low glycemic index foods. But also there's a medication like I talked about before called spironolactone. And spironolactone is a mild diuretic that blocks those hair cells that more won't start growing. Now spironolactone is also, like I said, a mild diuretic. So it's really important if you're going to take this to understand the risk that it can make you dizzy if you don't drink enough water. And it's important to check your kidney levels at least once a year to make sure that you don't have any kidney dysfunction and it would make you more susceptible to feeling dizzy from taking spironolactone. 
So again, there are options and you deserve to know. One thing I want you to think about is that there are many of us healthcare providers are certified menopause practitioners. And so at True, myself and Suzanne Pettigrew, PA who's working with True, we are certified menopause practitioners. And it's really important because we get extra training in how hormones affect our health. So I hope this has been helpful to talk about belly fat and chin hair and why you might be at risk and why you don't want belly fat other than the reasons that you already know. This is so important to know to add years to your life and to live your true life. At True, that's what we do. We want to know you, but more than anything, we want you to know you and we want you to have as many good years as you can and to live your true self. So thank you for joining me today and please let us know if you have any questions and be well. Thank you.